Well, can you believe it's Christmas? That they say that Christmas is, and Brad said it too, that Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. At least that's what Andy Williams sang in the 1960s, right? And uh, I think we heard Seal sing that the other day. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Sadly, though, the most wonderful time of the year, I think, has morphed into the most stressful time of the year. Anybody agree with that? Why is Christmas stressful? You have to agree with me that to a certain degree it's stressful. Traffic is horrendous. Has anybody else noticed that we live over by the mall? And like just to get out of our neighborhood on, it's like takes, I don't know how long. I mean, traffic's horrendous. The lines at the stores are already long. Vicky goes to the store the other day. She said, I'll be gone 10 minutes. I'm just picking up a couple of things. I think about three hours later she shows up. Now, she blamed it on long lines. I, have not, I haven't checked our credit card bill, so I have no idea. But, but um, uh, man, the, the stores are packed with shoppers. We spend more money during this time of year than any other time of the year. They tell us in the retail business that up to, up to 30%, if not more, of the money that is spent during the course of the year is spent during the Christmas season. All of that is stressful. And if that wasn't enough, there's times that we have to get together with family members that we just don't like a lot, all right? So sometimes, anybody else? That's why Vicki and I moved all the way to Florida, away from, no, that's not true. All right, but sometimes we have these family get-togethers and it's like, oh no, Uncle Charlie's going to be there, or oh no, Aunt Somebody is gonna be there. And it's just stressful for us. A few years ago, NBC News did a poll and found out that 45% of Americans would prefer to skip Christmas. I'm not sure whether that's you or not. They're like, hey, you know, let's just jump from Thanksgiving to New Year's. Let's kind of skip the stress of Christmas. The simple truth is this, that Christmas has, has become a calendar full of activities. Has it not? I'm sure your calendar is full for the month of December. Our calendar is already full for the month of December. We often do so much during the holiday season that we rarely have time to enjoy Christmas. So, so uh, as, a, as a leadership team, we've sat back and, and, and prayed through our, our Christmas series, prayed through what are the truths that we would love to convey to our church family this year. And we asked ourselves the question, what if this year we did Christmas different? What if this year Christmas wasn't something that we did, but rather something that we were? In other words, as the, as the video said just a few moments ago, this year, let's not just do Christmas. Let's not just have a calendar full of activities. But, let's, but this year, let's be Christmas. By that, we mean let's live out the principles that are found in the nativity. And so during the month of December, we want to we wanna flesh out the idea of be Christmas. What does it mean to be Christmas? What does it mean being Christmas? And we prayerfully come up with five truths that, that, that we truly believe that if they are lived out, they will make your Christmas the most, the most wonderful time of the year. And they will make this Christmas the best Christmas for you and for me. And so what does it mean to be Christmas? Five things that we came up with, and we're going to develop it the next five weeks. The first, to be Christmas means to worship fully, to be worshipfully. And we're going to flesh that out today. It means to give generously. We'll flesh that out next week. And don't think you already know what that means. You might sit back and think, oh, no, here comes another offering, another sermon on giving. Listen, Christmas is all about giving. When we're out there in the community, it's all about giving to give generously. Christmas means to love unconditionally. Christmas means to believe wholeheartedly. 
And Christmas means to spend wisely. We're going to talk about that the last Sunday of the month. We probably ought to talk about that the first Sunday of the month, but we're going to address it the last Sunday of the month. So, so to kick off our series today, I would like to, us to look at one of the greatest Christmas songs that has ever been written. Think through that. What is the greatest Christmas song that has ever been written? I know some of you are thinking, he's going to talk about Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, right? <laughs> greatest Christmas song. Don't you like... I love that song, Grandma Got Run. Have you ever heard that one? One of my favorite Christmas songs. That's not what we're going to talk about this morning, all right? Uh, We're not even going to talk about your favorite Christmas carol. Now, one of the uh, greatest Christmas praises ever written is the Magnificat. It's Mary's song of praise that is found in Luke chapter 1. So would you grab your Bibles with me and turn to Luke chapter 1. We want to spend just a few moments reading this passage of Scripture and then not only reading it, understanding its historical significance, but even most importantly, applying it to our lives and understanding how this Christmas can be a Christmas of worship, how you and I can worship fully so our life can be a worshipful Christmas this year. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46, I'll put the verses up on the screen. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. By the way, not only can Mary say that, but you can say that today. For the God who is mighty has done great things for you. Holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Would you pray with me today and bow your head and your heart and, and, and ask God to prepare your heart to be Christmas this year. Lord, thank you for the wonderful time that we've been able to lift our voices and worship you. But Lord, truly, worship isn't about the songs we sing. Worship is about the condition of our hearts. And as you've not only heard the words that we have sung, you have observed the condition of our hearts. And Lord, I trust that you've been pleased. I trust that not only the songs, but the attitude of our heart is just like a sweet-smelling fragrance that has floated up into your nostrils. And you are pleased by who we are and how we are today. So, Lord, as we look at this wonderful song that Mary sang, I pray that you would teach us from your word, but even more importantly, give us a Holy Spirit-powered determination to be Christmas this year for our lives and our families to be different. Lord, help us to be able to exemplify the gospel and maybe even point someone to Jesus Christ this Christmas. Thank you for what you have done, and thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So today's passage relates to the story of Mary finding out that she was to be the mother of the Christ child. It's a magnificent story. It is a, it is a miracle-filled account of God's plan for the incarnation of his son. You know the story. So uh, Gabriel comes to Mary literally out of the blue and, and says to her in verse 28, we didn't read it, says to her, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. As you would expect, Mary was frightened by the appearance of the angel. You would have been frightened by the appearance of the angel. I would have been frightened by the appearance of the angel. In Old Testament times, usually the arrival, the sudden arrival of a heavenly being indicated judgment. But Gabriel looked to her and said, favored one. I'm sure she thought, okay, that's good. (laughs) 
I'm not immediately in trouble. Gabriel continued, don't be afraid. For Mary, you have found favor with God. The the word favor here comes from the Greek word charis, which we normally translate grace. As a matter of fact, this word is found 157 times in the New Testament, 131 of the 157 times it's translated grace. And so the angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you have found favor, you have found grace with God. So like Noah, like Noah in the Old Testament, Mary had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Then Gabriel says something really startling. He looks at her and he says, and you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you'll call his name Jesus. The angel goes on and and makes a couple of tremendous prophetical pronouncement about Christ's coming and Christ's ministry, but I'm sure that Mary didn't hear any of that. As a matter of fact, the only thing Mary probably heard is, you're going to be pregnant, (laughs) And, and you're going to have a son. We know that because the question that Mary asks is not about the greatness of her son, what he's going to accomplish. The question that Mary asks very simply is this, how? (laughs) I'm a virgin. I don't have a husband. How is this going to transpire? Uh, Mary was young. They say probably 14, 15, 16 years old. She was young, but she was not naive. Mary knew about the birds and bees. (laughs) And and Mary knew that, that you didn't get pregnant by just getting close to boys, all right? She knew that, humanly speaking, she could not be pregnant. And yet the angel tells her that she will have a son. In response to her question, in verse 35, Gabriel Gabriel gives us the clearest explanation of the virgin birth in all of Scripture. If you have your Bible in front of you, your iPad or your iPhone, look at this verse, verse 35. The angel Gabriel describes exactly what is going to transpire. He says, for the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Of God. The key word in the passage is the word overshadowed, and we could get in and do a word study, but very simply, here is what the angel Gabriel is, is saying. Mary, you will become impregnated by a divine act of God. Now, I know from a human perspective, that's, that, that's impossible. We get that, right? Re- re- remember that the individual writing this was Luke. What was Luke? Luke was a doctor. Uh, Luke Luke understood the birds and the bees. Luke understood how babies were conceived. Luke understood that Mary was a virgin. Yet even though Luke understood the medical impossibility of what he was prophesying, yet by faith he believes it. And by faith he records it. Mary's response is no less shocking (laughs) Rather than saying, whoa, time out, I got plans. I haven't graduated from high school. My my prom's coming up in just a few weeks. I wanted to try out for the cheerleading team. Rather than saying any of those things that we maybe would have come up with, Mary simply says this, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. In other words, here Here's what Mary's saying. Mary's saying, God, here's my body. Here's my life. You do with it whatever you want. I sat back and thought, wow, how many times have I actually said that in my life? How many times have I actually come to the place where I said, okay, God, I don't get what's going on. It doesn't make sense. I don't even like it, but God, here I am. I'm your servant. You do with me, you do through me, whatever you want to do. In response to this great truth, Mary breaks out in song. Now, I wish we had a recording of Mary singing it. 
I'm not sure whether Mary had a good voice or whether Mary didn't have a good voice or you know, whether we could have recorded this and maybe this would have gone off on Spotify and been one of the leading songs of her time. I'm not exactly sure, but Mary breaks out in song. And her worship experience here in Luke chapter one is a wonderful demonstration of what worship really is. Let me pause for a second and say this. We must understand worship. You and I think that worship is the time when Stephen leads us in singing. And that is worship. But that is not the only worship experience that we can have, we should have. As a matter of fact, I trust that right now at this moment that you're in a worshipful spirit. Your ears are open, your heart is open, and you are allowing God to speak to your heart. What is that? That is worship. Worship is not something that just takes place on Sunday morning. You and I should be worshipful. We should worship fully 24-7, seven days a week, most especially during this Christmas season. So how can your Christmas be filled with worship? How can you and I worship fully? What does that mean? You might say, Brian, I got it covered, man. From the moment I go in my house, we hit the, the recorder and Pentatonix is playing Christian, Christmas music all the time, all right? Or I just bought Carrie Underwood's most recent Christmas album or CD or whatever. I've downloaded it, and so I'm worshiping all the time. That's great. Do that. But what does it mean to worship fully? Let me share a couple of things, truths that we can pull from Mary's worship experience that I trust will be helpful, as helpful to you as they have been to me. The first is understood in the passage. You might not see it, but it's understood in the passage. You see, to worship fully means to saturate your mind and your heart with God's word. Think about that for a second. It means to saturate your mind and your heart with God's word. Now, now, you maybe didn't realize it, but Mary's song of praise here in Luke chapter 1 is very similar to Anna's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't say that they're almost identical, but, but, but Mary, no doubt, is using Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2 as a pattern for her song of worship in Luke chapter 1. If you don't believe me, I know it's kind of hard to bounce back and forth from two passages. Let me show you parallel passages side by side of Anna's prayer and Mary's song of worship. So in 1 Samuel 2, 1, Anna says, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. What did Mary say? Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Notice, notice the next verse in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Anna says, there is none holy like the Lord. And what does Mary say? And holy is his name. Uh, the next verse, Anna says, the bows of the mighty are, are, are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Mary says, and he has broken down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Let me show you one more, and you can do the comparison later. Anna say, or Hannah says, those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. Mary says, he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Listen, you will notice that, that the parallels are not word for word. I'm not telling you that, that, that Mary memorized Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and she's just quoting verbatim what Hannah prayed and Luke is not doing that either. Instead, it seems to me, catch this, please catch this, that Mary is so steeped in Scripture that when she breaks out in praise, the words that naturally come to her lips are what? Are the words of God. They're scripture. I, I love that idea. Here's the idea. I put it in your outline. Here's the idea. The more you know God and his word, the more freely you can worship him. 
Does that make sense today? Does that make sense today? Boy, boy where's Brad? We've got to work on pulling it out of you this morning, all right? Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying at times worship is difficult for us because we don't know God's word. We haven't saturated God's word with our mind and our heart. And so we want to praise, but we don't know what to say. We want to pray, but, but we're not exactly sure how we go about it. Sadly, some believers know so little of God's word that they are limited in their ability to praise. Can I say that again? That's pretty deep if I can say so myself. Some believers know so little of God's word that they're limited in their ability to praise. spend so much time watching television. We spend so much time surfing the internet. We spend so much time doing other things. And we spend such little time in God's word. They tell me, I'm not sure who does the research, but they tell me that our generation is the most biblically illiterate generation in the history of our country. Why is that we're distracted by other things? And worship does not come naturally to us because we don't saturate our mind and our heart with God's word. David David wasn't that way. Notice, if you'll notice in Psalm 119 how David connected scripture with praise. Psalm 119 in verse seven, he says, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. Now you're gonna see the words that David uses for scripture. He's not talking about the Psalms. He's not talking about beautiful passages of scripture. He says this, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. When David wrote this, he didn't have the full Bible that you and I have today. He couldn't turn to the book of Psalms because he was writing the book of Psalms. He couldn't turn to the New Testament. It hadn't been written. He had five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are the five books that he has. And he says, man, I love, here's what he says, I love spending time in the book of Leviticus. I love spending time in the book of Deuteronomy. God, those rules that you give me, those righteous rules, man, they impassion me. And it causes me to praise you. Verse 16, I will delight in your statutes, for I will not forget your word. Verse 47, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Verse 62, I love this. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. How many of us have ever woken up at midnight and said, oh, my word, God, I love it when you tell me what I shouldn't do and what I should do. And I'm going to wake up at midnight just to praise you for that. (laughs) David realized that the more he knew Scripture, the more he could worship. Can can I challenge you to do a couple of things during the Christmas season? Can Can I challenge you to turn off the TV some? Can I challenge you to close the computer? Can I challenge you to put your phone to one side and spend time in God's word? Saturate your mind and your heart with God's word. Three three words that I would encourage you, learn to meditate. The, The word meditate means to think about what you read. We don't read the Bible like the newspaper. We don't read it like Sports Illustrated. We don't read it like ESPN. We read it and we think about it, we meditate, we chew on it. What is God telling me? Memorize, memorize God's word, guard God's word in your heart so that uh, whenever moments of praise come up, man, you can naturally cry out God's word. I would encourage you too to learn to pray scripture. This is something that, 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 that I'm just learning and trying to put into practice. Rehearse and repeat God's word back to him. Each and every day, part of my devotional routine is, uh, is to read through a couple of chapters and then go back and pray through those chapters, praying God's word to him and asking God to use what he says in his word, those promises, those commands, those exhortations, to put them into practice in my life. 
So you want to worship fully this year? Here's what it means. Saturate your mind and your heart with God's word. The more you know God's word, the more you will freely be able to praise him. Let me show you a second thing that we see. The second thing that Mary shows us, worshiping fully means to magnify Jesus. Here's what she said. She said, my soul, what? Magnifies the Lord. The word, the word magnify is an interesting word. It, the, the Hebrew word can mean to enlarge or to increase. It can mean to exalt. It can mean, and, and I like this definition for this word here, it can mean to display greatness in its proper dimension. <laughs> Let me illustrate. I didn't, I didn't bring a magnifying glass, but a magnifying glass, if I had a magnifying glass today, a magnifying glass does what? It takes something small and it what? Makes it larger, all right? And so you, you have something with really small print and you reach in and you grab the magnifying glass. It takes this really small print and it makes it what? Large enough so that you can see. The, the idea Mary is not saying, boy, I'm gonna take this really little God and I'm going to make him big. I'm going to magnify him. That's not what Mary is saying. Mary's not talking about a magnifying glass. I believe Mary is talking about what? A telescope. What's a telescope do? You, you, you look through the telescope. There are some really good looking people out there, let me tell you. <laughs> You look through the telescope, and actually you look up in the sky, the telescope, and to us the stars seem what? Really small. But we know that we don't see those stars in their what? In their proper dimension, in their proper size. And even a telescope doesn't do that, but a telescope helps us what? Just a little bit to begin to understand the dimension, the greatness, the awesomeness of what we are seeing through the telescope. So, so here's what Mary was saying, my soul. She's not saying that, that, that her soul magnifies Jesus. It's not that we take a small Jesus and make him big. That's not what Mary is saying. She doesn't need to enlarge him. You don't need to enlarge Jesus. He's big enough, he's strong enough, he's powerful enough without you and without me. We don't need to make him bigger. Here's what she's saying. I want to show Jesus in his proper dimension to those who come in contact with my life. I want, to, I want to demonstrate for others who see Jesus as small how big he really is. Isn't that a great responsibility for us as believers? Because the world, quite frankly, see Jesus as really small. The, the world just doesn't have time for Jesus. He's small. He's insignificant to them. Part of our job, especially during the Christmas season, is what? Is to magnify him. Is to show the world, no, he's not small. He's not tiny. He's not impotent. He's not, um, he's not weak. He's extremely powerful. He's awesome. I want to magnify him. In this song, Mary magnifies the Lord. She says, she says four or five things. Let me just mention them to you and you can flesh them out later. She says in verse 48 that he is gracious. God, God sees her humble estate and he extends grace to her. He, he gave Mary what she never or could never ever deserve. It's what he does for us as well. In verse 49, she says that he is, is holy, just like Hannah did in 1 Samuel chapter 2. In verse 50, she says that, that, that he is merciful, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to uh, generation. I love that. His mercy is for generation to generation. God not only desires to bless you, but also your kids and your grandkids. He desires to extend his blessings to succeeding generations. Why is that? He's merciful. Verses 51 through 53, she says he is just. You, you can read those verses. She says that God reverses the strengths of this world. Those who are mighty are pulled down, and those who are lowly are exalted. Those who are hungry are filled with good things, while the rich are sent away empty. God's what? He's just. He demonstrates his justice. And then in verses 54 and 55, she says he is faithful. 
Notice he talks about he has helped his servant Israel. In spite of Israel's unfaithfulness, God was faithful to them. In other words, here's what Mary's saying. God fulfilled his covenant promises. To Abraham and to his descendants who were unfaithful, God has been faithful. And God fulfilled his covenant promises. Those are great truths. But how does that apply to you and me this Christmas? Let me kind of make that practical for us. Because as I say in the notes, like Mary, you can magnify the Lord this Christmas. It, It doesn't mean that you open up your door and you yell out, my soul magnifies the Lord. You can do that if you want. Your neighbors might think you're crazy. What does it mean to magnify the Lord? Let me mention just three simple things. First of all, you and I can magnify the Lord by recognizing his greatness. Recognizing his greatness in his life. When was the last time that you praised him for his power? When was the last time that you praised him for his compassion? When was the last time that you just paused and praised him for his mercy in your life? Maybe more than any other time of the year, you and I need to take time during the Christmas season and praise God for his greatness. Here's a great question that you can just chew on this afternoon. Do you magnify God or do you diminish God? Through, Through your words, through your actions, through your responses. Are you magnifying him or are you diminishing him? Are you causing those around him to see him for as great as he is? Or are you just justifying in their minds the erroneous concepts that they have of God that they have seen lived out through unfaithful Christians through the year or through the years? You see, we be Christmas whenever we magnify Jesus. Here's the second thing. You magnify him by celebrating his faithfulness. By celebrating his faithfulness. What are some great things that God has done in your life this year? I guarantee you he's done some awesome things in your life. I guarantee you he's done some stupendous, magnificent, wonderful things in your life. Why is it that we have a tendency to forget his blessings and yet we have a tendency to remember the disappointments in our life? You see, to magnify him means that, man, we are going to celebrate his greatness, his his faithfulness. Worship is reflecting upon those blessings and giving praise to the one who made those blessings possible. You might sit back today and say, Brian, you don't get it. This has been the worst year of my life. Listen, you still should praise him. You say, why is that, Brian? Because you're alive today. I I had an older gentleman. We we used to serve in Canton, Ohio, and the congregation was pretty much filled with senior adults, and I loved some of the sayings. And so um, there was this one gentleman that I I said hi to almost every single Sunday, and I'd say, I forget his name. I'd say, how you doing? He said, great. And then he'd look at me and say, any day above ground's a good day, Brian. (laughs) You're above ground today. (laughs) It's a good day. (laughs) You're breathing today. It's a good day. You were able to get up and put clothes on and come to church. It's a good day. You're able to meet together with God's people. It's a good day. You're going to be able to go home and watch the dolphins today. No matter what happens to the dolphins, it's a good day. Celebrate God's faithfulness in your life. That's what it means to magnify him. Let me give you something else. Let me give you something else. You magnify him whenever you make him a priority in your life. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on your toes right now. You magnify him whenever you make him a priority. You see, I get it. Christmas is, for many people, the greatest time of the year. I, I was teasing in Spanish. Vicky wasn't in there. But if it was up to Vicky, we'd start listening to Christmas music in September. Right? I just have to put, you know, you know these 
rules in. You, you know, I have to be the spiritual leader and say, no, we're not going to listen to Christmas music in September. So we've compromised. We, we start listening to Christmas music first of November. Isn't that right, Vicki? And so, I mean, she wants to decorate. If you come to our house and you're invited to our house, it's fully decorated. It's beautiful. But listen, when Christmas is not about decorations. Christmas is, is not about family get-togethers. And you're going to spend a lot of time with family. And I would encourage you, don't put family above your relationship with the Lord. Don't put family above church. Make him a priority. It's not about family. Christmas is not about gift giving or receiving. Here's what Christmas is about. Christmas is about Jesus. That's what Christmas is about. Listen, we... We often allow the distractions of Christmas to misdirect our attention away from Jesus. I thought, would you go to a birthday party and not say hello to the person who's celebrating the birthday? Would you go to a party that's celebrating someone or someone for their accomplishment and not spend time with that individual? That would be unheard of. Why? Because the party is all about that person and what they've accomplished. Christmas is about Jesus. And yet we allow all the things around us to distract us and take our focus off him. I'm not saying don't decorate your house. I'm not saying don't get together with your family. I'm not saying don't buy your pastor a gift. Buy him a gift. That's not what I'm saying today. <laughs> Here's what I'm saying. Make Christmas about Jesus. Anything that focuses or distracts your focus from Jesus is an idol. And, and we have acceptable idols in our culture. Family is an acceptable idol in our culture. Sports are an acceptable idol in our culture. Anything that distracts football, unless it's the Ohio State Buckeyes that are playing, right? Isn't that right, Josh? Huh? Let's not be fanatical here, okay? Anything that distracts your attention from Jesus is an idol. Make Jesus your focus this Christmas. Here, here's what I was thinking and praying this week. What if this year, and we're talking about making Christmas different, what if this year we minimized what we normally magnify and we decided this year we're going to magnify Jesus? We're going to make sure as a family that the most important thing in our family, the most important thing in our home, the most important thing in our life is Jesus and Jesus alone. I promise you, if you'll minimize family and maximize family, or excuse me, and magnify Jesus, that your time with family will be sweeter. I promise you that. If you minimize all the other distractions and magnify Jesus, I promise you, this could be, this might be the best Christmas that you have ever experienced. Why? Because your focus is going to be right, and you're going to be doing the right thing. Magnify Jesus. Let me mention two other things quickly. Mary demonstrates for us that, that worshiping fully means to surrender yourself to him. Mary understood this principle. In verse 38, she said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. In verse 48, she says, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. The word servant there is the Greek word for slave in the New Testament. Here it means a female slave. Here's what it means. One who gives up herself to accomplish the will of another. So here's what Mary says, as we've already mentioned. I am, God, your humble servant, your slave. You do with me what you want. And we know how the story ends. How, how does that relate to us? Let me give you two practical ways, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. Surrendering yourself to Jesus reminds you of your condition. Surrendering yourself to Jesus on a regular basis reminds you of your condition condition. You see, we have a tendency to feel overconfident. We have a tendency to be independent. We have a tendency to be self-sufficient. And you and I need to be constantly reminded of our depravity. So, so let me challenge you this Christmas. Beware of anything that makes you feel strong. 
Beware of anything that makes you feel self-sufficient. Beware of anything that makes you feel independent. Be vigilant. Keep your posture that of spiritual descend, a dependency. That might sound strange, but you and I have to remind ourselves on a regular basis that we desperately need God. I'd love to look at you today and say, man, I am a pastor that has it all together. I'm a phenomenal pastor. I'm a phenomenal husband. I'm a great dad. I got it all together, but the, that would be an exaggeration at best, most probably a lie. Here's what I am. I'm a pastor. I'm a husband. I'm a dad who desperately needs Jesus in my life. I, I'm a man that if I'm not careful, I sit back and I become self-sufficient and I think I can do it on my own. And that is such a dangerous position to be in. I need to be reminded every day, God, here's what I am. I am your humble servant. Without you, I am nothing. I can't love my wife the way I need to love her without the power of God. I can't minister the way I need to minister without the power of God. God, I cannot do it myself. I need you. That's what Mary was saying. God, you're asking me to do something that no one has ever done before. How can I do this? I'm your humble servant. You do with me, through me, whatever you want. Surrendering reminds us of our condition. We need Jesus. Surrendering also reminds us of our mission. During this Christmas season, let's remember that we are on mission with Jesus. As his servants, we have been called to represent him. Here's a great truth. You can flesh this out in your mind. Let's be incarnational this Christmas. By that, Jesus was incarnational when he came to earth and he took upon sinful flesh. He became one of us. John chapter 1 and verse 14, we call his coming the incarnation. He became one of us. He, he identified with us. Let's be incarnational this Christmas and let's do our best to identify with those around us. Are there people that are going to get on our nerves? <laughs> Absolutely. Let's be Jesus to them. Is there somebody that's going to cut in front of you at Walmart? <laughs> Probably. Be Jesus to them. Is traffic going to be so bad that somebody's going to make you upset? Yeah. Be Jesus to them. Somebody's going to ask you for a handout and you're going to sit back and think, oh, I know what they're going to use that for. Be Jesus to them. You see, surrendering reminds us of our mission. We're representatives of Jesus Christ. And during Christmas, that's what we want to do. I think they're trying to tell me I need to be done. I don't know. <laughs> the last thing, worshiping fully means to share your story. This is really interesting because... This was such an intimate thing that Mary was going through. Mary could have decided, I don't want anybody to know what I'm going through. Nobody's going to understand me. Everybody's going to criticize me. They're going to accuse me of being immoral. They're going to accuse me of doing something that I didn't do. I don't want anybody to know. Let's go out into the wilderness of Judea, and I'll have this baby, and I don't want anybody to know. Let's keep it secret. That's not what Mary does. She takes this, this wonderful act that God is doing in her life, and she what? She shares it with everyone else. Let me magnify God. I don't understand what he's doing in my life, but let me tell you, we wouldn't have this story if Mary had not shared it. But because Mary shared it, we can treasure it today. Listen, you have a story. Just as God powerfully worked in Mary's life, God is powerfully working in your life. What should you do? Share it. 
share it with others. There is no better time of year than to share our faith with those around us. Brad alluded to it in our welcoming time. This is the best time of the year to invite someone to church. Tom Rayner with LifeWay Statistics has done all kinds of research and said this. You know why your neighbors won't come to church? Because you haven't invited them. I haven't invited them. Statistics show that if you invite them, they will come. Hey, we got 2,000 invitations on that back table back there. I simply say, be Christmas. Listen, this year, if we won't just do Christmas, but we'll be Christmas, there's no limit to what God can do through our lives. I don't know about you, but I'm really hoping that we come to December 31st and we look back and say, this was an awesome Christmas. Not because the kids came in, not because the grandkids came in, not because I got the gift that I wanted. This was an awesome Christmas because this Christmas we worshiped him fully. We gave generously. We loved unconditionally. We believed wholeheartedly and we spent wisely and we lived out the principles of Christmas this year.